All right. Um, happy Saturday again. Um, this is the final video of today, Saturday the 30th of September. And I'm super excited to continue going down this direction of our technical series of videos, this time in real-time rendering in XR. Super high level reminder, generative landscapes is the connection of all three of these core pieces of technology. We've really been focusing in on parametric and performance modeling. That's, that's where you know the, the real guts of performance modeling will come from. We're using AI to help us imagine generators, um, either by crafting them or by um, you know imagining different uh, geometric shapes. And uh, we're using these pieces of tech in different ways, but we've really been focusing down here. And it's like gonna be so much fun to start working uh, with the real-time rendering and immersive XR output. So for this session, uh, we set up the context, the conceptual background, some history of where real-time rendering came from, where it exists today, and we got a bit of a deep dive on XR. So now let's get into the tools that you guys will use. And we're going to go into Twin Motion, not super deep. Um, Twin Motion is so much fun, and I, I almost don't want to spoil the fun of Discovery because it's a, it's a really fun tool to use, and I'll, I'll show you why and how. But I wanted to cover why we chose Twinmotion for you. Uh, some overview and direction to some learning resources, a little bit of interface and features, and then just quickly how to push designs from Grasshopper to Rhino to Twinmotion, and then how to get into VR. So uh, let's focus in on Twinmotion part one. Why did we choose Twinmotion? What were some direction and learning resources and some interface overview? So in the spectrum of real-time rendering tools specific for spatial design, like architecture, engineering, uh, construction, landscape architecture, maybe even some product design, th there's a lot of tools out there. And I'm sure some of you have already tried some of these or recognize their logos. Onscape uh, was really, really popular and maybe still holds on to a, a bit of the industry market right now. Lumion is really great. Uh, it was probably king in terms of graphics, maybe five or six years ago. D5 is kind of a newer, um, newer company, really high quality, just kind of, kind of new. And then there's twin motion. So out of all these tools, why did we pick twin motion? Um, first and foremost, I want to consider the parent company of a lot of these. Chaos Tools, the, the people that own V-Ray and a few of the other tools that you might already be kind of familiar with, they bought Onscape or I guess merged, whatever the right term is. But in any case, Chaos essentially owns Onscape at this point. And they have a very current industry stronghold. A lot of people use it in the US, across the world. It is, it is kind of a, a standard right now. Uh, Lumion and D5, they're independently owned. I honestly, you know, they, they will be a niche tool because they're independent. And Twinmotion, the same way that Onscape was acquired, uh, Twinmotion was acquired by Unreal Engine. For those of you that don't know Unreal Engine, it is the main tool, main, main product of Epic Games. Epic Games are the same people that make uh, a variety of video game tools, um, a variety of games themselves, uh, Fortnite being the kind of most popular title. Um, <clears throat> and Unreal is becoming its own, its own way, a kind of like game engine for a lot of different uh, industry connections. And 
Uh, Autodesk made a, a significant partnership with Unreal last year. Uh, we pivoted away from Unity, um, mostly because we're seeing some better results in Unreal, better integration, data retention. So even though Chaos and Onscape has the kind of current industry hold, um, Unreal and Autodesk <clears throat> is a great future industry alignment. And in the ecosystem, Unreal also has um, mega scans from Quixel and Sketchfab. And like, you know, yes, the, these are, I would say these are probably the industry standard for a lot of uh, great scans and assets. <clears throat> the other players have some of their own libraries of stuff to populate a scene. But because of mega scans and sketchfab, we're we're talking like huge firepower here uh, that Unreal Engine is uh, giving to Twin Motion, uh, and Epic Games is giving. So I mean, think about the future here. Unreal is allowing people to make video games, and that's going to trickle into Twin Motion. You will eventually be able to get interaction things like. Um, video game control, um, uh, trigger moments where you're able to trigger certain events when you approach an object, maybe even um, being able to treat to in motion like a video game light. Um, and then integration, it's, it's got the alliance with Autodesk. It's gonna be a huge deal as that continues to go forward. And then Mega Scans and Sketchfab has got amazing reality scans and assets and libraries, so you can populate your scenes with these amazing, um, amazing things. So this is the primary reason that we aligned the course with Twin Motion. Now there are some other practical reasons. Um, one of the really good ones is. Uh, some learning resources, quite frankly, like the uh, Twin Motion YouTube videos are great. There's, um, I don't know how many in here, oh, 239, my, my mistake, a huge amount of videos um, telling you how to do everything from adding vegetation, using mega scans, path tracers to make certain cameras go through, um, making models look like they are rendered as terms of like clay models or cardboard models. Um, there's so much fun you can have with Twin Motion, and there's a great community documenting all this and official videos um, coming out here. So I hope you all subscribe and check it out. It's super neat. Outside of the YouTube videos, Twin Motion on their learning resources um, tab, if you go to the twinmotion.com, has courses. So um, these are little courses you can kind of follow along. Uh, some of them have files, uh, some of them have, um, I think, micro certification on some of them. Uh, some of these are duplicate with the YouTube videos, so you might see some overlap here, but a great place to see things. And they have a free edition for education. So I know that some of the other tools do too, but uh, this is pretty easy. So if you haven't already got yourself Twin Motion, uh, you can over, head over to twinmotion.com, uh, go to licensing and pricing, and you can go to education edition. We don't even have to get you any special licenses or anything, it's just straight up. The only thing you cannot do is use it for commercial projects. There is a, a tag that gets added um, uh, onto some of the exports, and it's just a limitation, but it's all good. Uh, you will need an Epic account in order to get this, uh, so you can either create one or sign up. Uh, but once you do, it'll download as either an MSI file or .ex executable. And hypothetically, once you get this set up, uh, you'll be able to uh, boot up Twin Motion and give it a try. So I'm going to just switch over here to Twin Motion. Uh, when you start, 
uh, to in motion, uh, it'll probably look like this. It'll boot up, it'll be a little floating window, and it'll say, hey, here's your home view, there's templates, there's learning, uh, you can check out all their links, either YouTube, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, to see more results or things. There's a link to documentation. Learning is super fantastic. I highly recommend that you check it out. There are templates you could use. Um, so architecture, product design. Um, these are handy if you want to just see how other people configure uh, their, their files. But in all honesty, you're probably just going to want to go here to new scene. And apologies, I'm just going to turn on my pointer focus just to let you guys track where I'm going. So you would want to go to new scene. And when you get a new scene, uh, you're presented with this interface. And I'm going to give you the sh super shortened version here. Um, basically, uh, the videos from their series will be way cooler and more interesting. This is just the hyper compressed version. Um, here on the left, you have two options for this docked panel. You have library, which gives you elements that you can use to populate your scene as implied by library. Uh, you can also check out statistics and you can check how well your computer is doing. And it'll tell you, you know, how much of your GPU is being used, how much of your CPU is being used. Um, and you can see here, my GPU is running right up to the top, um, which is good. I would rather have that going high than my CPU going high. Uh, but overall, the thumbs up is the, the biggest thing you can do. If you're having challenges on your own machine, you could go to um, a quality setup here, and you could change this in order to be a little lighter on your machine if you need. Uh, notice that there is two modes of visualizing things. There is real-time rendering uh, for resolution scaling and path tracing. Uh, so just keep aware that those are two different modes. Um, and then there's uh, you know, general settings and appearance. Uh, general settings, um, I keep mine on meters. It, it should come in meters automatically, but um, it may be worth double checking that, that you want to change it to meters so that when you import your Rhino files later, it's the same. And it will respect your tolerance, uh, which is really great. And you can check all these other things here if you, if you really want to. Point clouds, and BR, how to manage it, and things of that sort. So I'm just going to go OK. I'm going to hide my statistics. And I can hide my library to completely get rid of that left docked uh, uh, panel. I can bring it back just by clicking on the button. And you will notice that the uh, when it turns blue, it's active. And when it's gray, it's unactive. On the right, you have essentially this element, which is um, uh, what's called your scene editor. This is all the elements in your scene kind of listed in a hierarchical structure. You can think of this like, like layers, quite frankly. Um, so that's your scene. And again, blue indicates that it's active and gray indicates that it's not. And then you have properties. And properties just gives you, it's, it's contextual. So depending on what you click on, um, properties may change. So you can see here, as I clicked on this pedestal geometry, it highlights it in the scene editor. Um, and nothing is available in properties. Uh, but if I don't do anything in properties, Oh, well, there was a, an element there where you could change a few things. Um, in any case, not to worry. Properties will come up contextually, and uh, you can change things as needed. But it's there if you, if you want. Um, so let's go into uh, just covering our bases here. Um, up at the top, there is a way to change your mode from path tracer to real-time rendering, 
Remember what path tracer is? It's like view tracing that we had in our previous lecture. It's casting all those rays out from your camera and bouncing it against the light. It creates much softer, smoother uh, images, but you can see how long it's taking for that to actually uh, render. It's, it's no longer real time because it's, it's laggy and it's taking time to calculate and you can see the little loading bar here. So uh, my recommendation is to keep this on, um, is to keep this on real time rendering and that's much smoother. I'm able to accomplish this smoothness by virtue of my 3D mouse. So that's all you're kind of looking at here as I'm navigating around. And uh, what we're gonna do is um, just see that now you can click on an object, you can change your, your widget here. So I'm just gonna move this around so I can actually see it. Uh, this allows you to move an object with your widget if you want. Sorry, widget or gizmo or gumball, they're all kind of the same. Uh, you can change its mode if you need to rotate an object, scale an object, uh, move with collision. Uh, this is pretty cool. This is coming from uh, game engine uh, influence here. So I could say move with collision. And if I had another object, it would smack into it. Um, I could do gravity and you can see here the ball dropped. So some, some pretty uh, pretty amazing stuff here. Uh, all of this is coming from uh, from the influence of Unreal. So uh, very, very exciting stuff. Um, that's a little toolbar up here. And really down here, these are probably going to be your main uh, your main tools uh, that that you're going to be using here. Oh, and I did want to come back to a uh, scene here. Up at the very top, there's a, a layer called Ambience. And when you click on Ambience, uh, it has a series of properties that you can work with. So let, let's just go over this super quickly. There's Environment, Camera, Rendering Mode, which is the same as up here, and there's some effects. So Environment, Time of Day, you can dial it up and down. You can see the change that that has. You can change the exposure just to kind of burn out um, from uh, your camera view, basically. You can change things like details, like sun intensity, sun size, uh, sun reflection, moon intensity, ambience, white balance, etc. cetera. Uh, you can make your scene more, more rainy. Um, you, it just dials and toggles between sun and rain. Let me just go up here and go back to my uh, exposure. Yeah, there we go. Uh, so rain here makes the ground uh, more reflectiony. You can see rain is hitting the screen itself, the the camera, and it's got this effect on the ground. Not bad, not bad at all. Uh, you can change it from uh, beach mode here, summertime to snow. Uh, so if you ever wanted to make a snow rendering, uh, this is the opportunity to do so. You can change things here like fog, if you want fog to enter your scene or wind to have a certain impact, uh, wind direction, vegetation growth, weather effects, uh, all these kinds of deals. Uh, you can change uh, your north direction. I never change this, it's just gonna stay the same. Um, I'm going to just turn off my snow. I don't really need it. And I'll make this sunny again. Uh, but yeah, you can do other things like uh, changing an HDR environment. Um, it may ask you to load one up. Um, I'm not going to bother really experimenting with this too much. Uh, just going to close this up if I can. And sorry, I have, a, I have a pizza in the oven, so I'm gonna have to check on that fairly soon. Uh, HDR is just a different lighting condition. I'm gonna disable it, not really needed. 
Uh, you can change things like your horizon view. Do you want to put an image on the background? Uh, you can change it. You can rotate that image if you want to. Maybe it's handy, maybe it's not. Uh, and then you get this thing called ocean. Uh, so this may be handy um, for some of you that are going to work really close to the beach. Uh, and you can see it will start to make a layer of water. There's other ways of making water. Uh, you can change its appearance to like tropical condition, Atlantic, rapids, uh, muddy, all, all kinds of fun little experiments here. I'm just going to click off and turn off ocean. But that's what happens when you work with ambience in the properties. Otherwise, everything else in properties is uh, kind of just awaiting you to do something uh, more substantial. Maybe if you put in vegetation, something will happen. So keep Keep aware that um, your properties panel is contextual. Okay, so again, down here are your main bars. We're gonna cover import in a second, um, but what I wanted to do uh, quickly is just focus a little more on landscape architecture stuff. Uh, and for that, the way to start is to actually go into library, um, you can go into vegetation. And under vegetation, there's something, excuse me, something called landscapes. It sounds a little counterintuitive, but uh, you'll see what I mean in a second because right now your starting ground, you can see here under properties, you can't really do much with this, uh, with this flat thing. It's, it's just there as a, a flat. Uh, base layer. But if I were to turn that starting ground off, here I am just kind of floating in the ether, and I bring in flat terrain, now under my properties menu, you'll see this contextual menu pop up. Here's the name of this. I can also rename this if I want to. We'll just call this terrain for now. Great. So under terrain, as an actual landscape feature, <clears throat> I'll just close up my library and maybe get myself into a slightly more top view. I get to do something kind of cool. I get to do painting or sculpting. And sculpting is super interesting. Um, it's like you are Toph from Avatar and you can earthbend uh, your topography simply by pushing and pulling it. It's, it's pretty fantastic. So under sculpt, there's raise, dig, smooth, adding noise, uh, erode, and flatten. So we'll just take a look here that you can click on each of these modes. You can pick the driving shape. Uh, circle is fine to start. You can change the diameter. In this case, it's 24 meters. It's a, maybe a little hard to see with this camera angle, so I'll just bend it down. Um, and you can see here that I can change intensity and diameter, and I'll just start clicking to let you see that I'm just lobbing this topography up and down. I'm just sculpting and drawing this terrain, and after it reaches a certain threshold, a certain slope, it starts to add a kind of rocky element by default. And, you know, I will just mention that this is, this is kind of fun. Uh, and I do want to keep this uh, feature in mind for you guys, because maybe you want to do some refinement inside of your designs uh, using this. So keep this in mind. Uh, I can do erode. Uh, there's these different experimental brushes you can work with. And painting. Painting allows you to pick a texture, uh, a texture scale, a shape, opacity, and diameter. And automatically, you'll see that it pops up and says, from your library, what do you want to paint with? And you can pick man-made textures or materials or some natural, quote unquote, natural materials. We'll just go to natural for now and I'll pick forest ground. And you can see that as I start painting here, you 
Let me bring this onto the ground. Yeah, paint tool, here we go. I want to paint with you, please. <laughs> Selected ground material, click in the scene to start painting. Yes, so sorry, I'm getting a little confused here that I need to click on this object in order for it to work. So um, you're seeing here some stuff happening. Um, it's worth experimenting, seeing what happens. Um, I can change that diameter. Uh, I can click on a different mode. Oh, it doesn't seem to... Maybe I have a small glitch. Um, in any case, painting is also worth worthwhile trying. Uh, maybe I'll go back to some man-made and see if there's some options here. Ah, yes, here I can pick some paint. Okay, so there was a weird toggle that was not working super well. Ah, there it is. I can... Uh, what happened is that I was scrolled down. You can see here, this little gray bar is a little invisible, but um, up here is a little dock of textures that you can play with. I just missed that. So I can go to like pebbles. And now when I click here, pebbles should be um, available for me to pick. If not, there's gravel and grass and these different options. seem to be a little stuck on this, but um, you get the idea. You can paint you can change texture scale, diameter, opacity if you want to see through things. So just some ways of coloring your, uh, your topography. So that's what happens when you have a landscape feature from library, vegetation, landscape. And they give you just a flat one and a rocky grasslands to start. So, um, you know, beyond landscapes itself, some of you I know have already been playing around with trees. Uh, you can change a bunch of things here if you want. I can just click on this object. And again, properties bar pops up and I can change its size and age. I can change it from being different times of the year, uh, winter, summer, automatic, uh, some pretty fun stuff here. I can tint my leaves. I can affect growth and wind. Pretty amazing stuff. Again, most of this is coming from the Unreal Engine side, so you're getting some pretty neat stuff here. But it's, it's as simple as that. Um, it is tuning your topography or your scene if you need to, adding in objects like, uh, uh, you know, maybe some water. You can add in a water cube. This object, I want to be able to scale. So I'm just clicking the gizmos and able to add some water features. Now, obviously, this for demonstration purposes is not like uh, the best example, but I can change uh, because it has just a hard cutoff. You'd have to fill this into a, an actual water feature yourself, uh, but you can change the different modes here and um, start having a lot of fun. Um, particles, you can, I saw some of you doing the smoke, which is really neat. Maybe that's something your landscapes do. Uh, this would be the chance to try it. Um, all kinds of things, doors, sounds. Uh, sounds is coming from the game engine side. And then there was those big benefits of mega scans, like 3D plants. Uh, maybe there are some floating plants you want to get. And you'll need to sign into your um, Epic accounts in order to download these. You'll see it'll ask you to do so. Um, it should know that I'm signed in. I click in here. Oh, I do have to sign in. Authentication procedures completed successfully. Great. And now that I, I 
I guess I hear all I did was click on my account and ensure that I am signed in, uh, which is the default. Uh, but in order to get mega scans from Quixel and Sketchfab automatically under your educational account, you do need to sign in and then you can start to download these. So you, here I am just downloading some water cabbage. It'll take a while. Um, if you're not familiar with mega scans, uh, I don't want variations. I just want to bring one down. Um, mega scans are uh, literally scanned in from reality. So these are people that go out and uh, scan these items and uh, in some cases animate them, like the fluttering of the leaves. But you can see this intense amount of detail that you can get from mega scans. And of course, um, you know, vegetation being one of them, there are other things you can get from mega scans as well, like surfaces, like grass and sand and stone, uh, asphalt uh, under surfaces, there's 3D assets like historical buildings, feudal Japan, like, wow, it's, it's really, really amazing stuff here. And if you wanted to even play with lights, I know some of you are, are going to be playing with lights. Uh, let's just go up to time of day and turn this really down. There's nighttime. There's the moon uh, reference. And you can bring in some lights. Uh, you can bring in some uh, square lights. Uh, these are based on real values. Let's just go somewhere where it's a little more obvious. So here, I want to move this light up. And, you know, you could start to play with a ton of stuff here. Intensity, attenuation, cone angle, uh, color temperature, uh, color itself. So some super fantastic, like, lighting effects that, um, again, the IES are based on real lights. And that has been a, a, a move that uh, Unreal and Twin Motion made a few years ago. Some other tools rely on your host program to do it, um, but these tools here are <coughs> pretty neat. You can see this amazing cross reflection here, the water light coming through. Here I am under the water, under these uh, plants. Some like super fantastic results. Um, I'm gonna delete quite a few of these items here. We've uh, talked about a number of them. I'm gonna go back to my library and vegetation and bring in a flat landscape just to reset us. Go back to my ambience to change my time of day. Uh, just to get us back here. And if you ever get lost, uh, either by zooming in or zooming out, you can right click on a, well, you can click on a feature that you see graphically, get to it in your scene editor, and you can go to um, essentially uh, zoom to selection, and that may help you. Uh, so, this is just a, a very brief introduction as to how to do things. Uh, that was purely just by playing with the materials and landscape first. Uh, and you can see what kind of world unfolded. Uh, but you can create your own materials if you want. Um, this allows you to make custom colors. We'll just do some pink. Okay. I'm going to apply this material to this uh, to this base instead of the other uh, material it gave me. I could uh, not apply it to the topography because the topography or the the terrain, if we recall, this flat landscape object uh, needs to be painted. So everything else we can do in a different way, but I can go back to materials click on it, see the properties here, and I can do some other things, maybe make them get purple, things like such. 
And, you know, it's painting, it's all kinds of stuff. I can make it more metallic if I want it and shiny. I can make it emissive and make it glow. I can uh, add some x-ray elements to it if I wanted so that it's invisible, kind of this blueprint view that is uh, typical from Fortnite. Um, some really, really interesting stuff here. So that's materials. I can go to populate and populate allows me to start populating things like paths, foliage and urban. Uh, urban, if I were to do uh, populate urban, it allows me to bring in uh, assets from real life. So I could go to Toronto, I'll go to Toronto, Canada and I'll zoom out here in this little map and maybe I'll go down to our site of the bar and let's just see what happens at Cherry Beach. Now, let's go download in place. So this is just going to take a couple seconds here. I'm going to pause while I uh, check on my pizza. One second, please. OK. And we can see here that uh, it has brought in some of that topography of the, the bar. Uh, there is kind of extending. There's a road. Um, you know, it. It does okay, and you know it even called it Cherry Beach here. Um, it's not the best import, but you know um, it does a job. So if you ever need to, Handland Boat Club. Wow, okay, it's getting some pretty decent information here. Um, but yeah, you know there's there's some things that you can try. Really fun. I'm just gonna get rid of this ground. Get back to our original. Uh, pedestal and just zoom in there. So uh, let's see, that was Populate uh, by Urban. There's Populate by Path. I can draw a path for characters to follow. I can change its width and you can see it's adding people here. If I wanted to change this scene, I can add more density, more people to this path. I can reverse their direction, changing them from walk or stationary. Um, you know, there's ways of uh, changing the particular types of people. So some interesting stuff here. Uh, I'm just going to delete that. Um, again, back in populate, I can populate things with foliage, such as uh, painting here. I can change a bunch of things. Uh, I need to drag a model to actually paint with. And you can see again, the contextual menu popped up. So I'll paint with maybe some linden trees. I'll paint with some basson poplars. And I will start to uh, paint with these trees. So just some fun ways of, of interacting with your environment. Again, I'm going to just delete this painted vegetation, populate. I had paths, foliage, and urban. And I can do different things with them. I encourage you to experiment. Uh, there is media. The media button basically uh, allows you to start doing things like either making a video, a panorama, multiple panoramas, a presentation where you walk things through. Um, phasing group, I haven't seen this one yet, to be honest, <laughs> uh, but you can add an image. And what an image does is basically act like a, like a little photo. Uh, so I can refresh it so it gets the view that I want. You can think of these as um, basically clips. Um, if I wanted to change this, maybe I go somewhere else. I can add a new image and you can see it's back here. So now I can flip between these and kind of make a bit of a movie, if you will. Um, so there's ways of experimenting with this. I can create a video itself. Um, so I can you know, start to 
add things to the movie by basically creating different scenes. I'm just adding a plus sign here. And I can play that movie back. So you can see here, I'm going between these in animation. This would be keyframing. Uh, so I did this little fly through here, which is super simple. And export. In export, you can do a bunch of things. You can export your videos. You can export images. You can export cloud uh, things so that you can share it with people online. I'll share some of my own. Um, but yeah, this gives you a little a little view as to uh, how how Twin Motion kind of works. Uh, so let's let's go back to our presentation here. Um, all right, the next big thing to talk about is how to push designs from Grasshopper to Rhino to Twin Motion, and then how to get into XR or VR. Well, there is a question that you have to ask yourself uh, before pushing into twin motion, which is if you go to import, you get four different options and each of them have different impacts or effects that you can do. So again, I'm just going to import. And when I click on import, I get these four different things, geometry, direct link, landscape, and point cloud. Uh, so I am super happy that uh, during my accelerator with Unreal last summer, that I had a major complaint. Um, and the team uh, at Epic was, was really concerned that I flagged this big thing, which is that when you import geometry as a landscape in 2022.1, you could not actually treat it as a landscape. You could not sculpt, you could not paint, you could not do anything. And since then, um, they basically have allowed landscape to be imported with those features. So if you want to sculpt and if you want to paint on your terrain, uh, you can import landscape. Uh, but we're going to walk through what the four different versions are and what its impacts are. So let's, let's take a look here. Um, <clears throat> the first thing that I did, uh, let me just dock this, uh, make this big, is I made a terrain inside of, um, inside of Rhino. I just did my surface and soft edit control to make these little, uh, these little hills. And I turned it into a mesh. Now, Meshes are the default of what, uh, what Twin Motion wants. It will not be able to read in a NURB surface. Uh, if you try to do it, it will force you to turn whatever object you had into a mesh. So just be conscious that every asset coming into Twin Motion, whether it's topography, uh, a surface of a roof, a person, a a block, uh, some sort of feature needs to be a mesh. It's just the way it goes. It's the way that um, uh, Unreal works, uh, works with mesh objects, not with nerves objects. And uh, that's how it goes. Now, <clears throat> again, coming into twin motion, I'm just going to start a new file or a new scene rather, uh, just because I, oops, file new. Do you want to save? No. Here's my new object, uh, new scene rather. I get these four options, point cloud, landscape, direct link, and geometry. Let's do the first one, geometry. So from Rhino, I can export my mesh. And as a, as a default, I really would recommend exporting your meshes as .fbx. OBJs are also OK, uh, but FBX, I find, is the most reliable. So I'm going to just call this test three. It'll ask you, do you want to export meshes only? Yes. Uh, some material settings. You don't need to change any of this. Uh, just hit OK. 
And I'm going to pause one more time just because that, that pizza is ready. Okay, sorry. I'm not stepping away there. So we exported our uh, topography as an FBX file. And inside of Twinmotion, I can say, hey, I want to import a piece of geometry. So I can click open and just find that test three FBX. And it'll ask for a couple options. I don't need to change anything. The units is meters, my Rhino units is meters, the up axis is auto, it knows. <clears throat> and I'll just hit import and my topography has come in and I can see what it looks like. I'm just gonna minimize the import window here. And I can start to uh, interact with this object. And what I mean by that is, uh, again, if, if it's properties, you can see here there's not much I can really do with it. It's like any other basic object. Uh, but like other basic objects, I could put um, other things on top of it. So let's say I wanted to add some vegetation, maybe a bush. You can see here it's following the object which is really neat. It, it kind of knows where its surface is. So I can put some things. Uh, let's try another object here. Maybe I'll do a primitive. Um, let's just add a sphere. Oops. And let's say I wanted to move this sphere around. Translate, please. Um, I could move this around, and again, I can play with its effect on gravity. What I wanted to do is to move it up here to see what it looks like on the hill. Sorry, I'm uh, working with the mouse and the, uh, and the object here. So I can now try to put this ball here and see its effect as it rolls down the hill, just for fun. Uh, this gravity effect is really neat. If you wanted to test a whole bunch of things, you could. Uh, pretty interesting interactions. In any case, that is object. And you know you can't really do that much with object. I'm just going to move this object up a little bit. This is intersecting with the grounds. There we go. Uh, you can't do much with it, but um, you can do things like change its material if you want it. So if I wanted to change this color to a kind of orangey color, I could, I could do things like that. So geometry, it's limited. You can put things on top of geometry, you can color geometry, but that's kind of about it. So I'm gonna go back to my scene and I'm gonna get rid of this object, get rid of that. And I'm just going to get rid of this sphere. Um, and the starting ground is cool, fine, fine, fine. But I want to import my uh, file as a landscape. Let's see what that looks like. So again, I'll just import test three. And here you see a couple of different options, up axis, smoothing is on. I'm just gonna use its basic stuff. Um, and I'm just gonna raise, uh, lower the starting ground down. And you can see how it brought in this topography slightly, slightly different. So it's interpreting that mesh geometry in its own way. Um, this is how it produced the effect. Sorry, I'm just going to minimize the import window here. Um, 
And I'm going to get rid of the starting ground just so that it's more obvious. So now what's different here is that if I click on this object, the properties context menu pops up and I can actually sculpt and paint on top of this. Now it is in beta, it is a little glitchy. So what I'm going to do is just uh, go to raise, uh, make my diameter a little smaller and make my intensity a little bigger just to see what it looks like. You can see it's like literally glitching out. <laughs> so take this with a grain of salt and some patience. Uh, it works. It's it is doing what it needs to. It's just not as smooth as working with a native twin motion topography. But if you wanted to import your geometry and play around with it and paint and sculpt, uh, you know, by all means, you can do these kinds of effects. Um, it can be it can be quite fun. So that was importing things as a topography. Now, we also talked about a third version. Uh, the third version is to push what's called a direct link from uh, Rhinoceros into Twinmotion. And you do this by a plugin from Unreal called Datasmith. So let's go to uh, Datasmith here. Smith Rhino. It's managed by Unreal Engine and uh, Twin Motion has its own. So you can see here Twin Motion exporter for Rhino. And it's updated. I honestly, I think this is going to be the last year that they do this. You can see it was updated this year. My connections and contacts to Unreal letting me know hey, this. Uh, this may be the last time that we do this because in the following years, we may have a different system to manage importing. But what you would do is download either for Windows or for Mac. Um, it'll create a, uh, I think it's an MSI file. And when it does and it's done loading, a little Datasmith uh, pop-up will appear for you, uh, usually when you start. And you can just dock this ribbon uh, somewhere with your main ones. I'm just left mouse button clicking this, tearing it off or docking it. And you can click on the button called Synchronize with Direct Link. When you click on Synchronize, it looks like nothing happened. It just says, hey, I exported large objects in meters to a data smith scene. Cool. What does that mean? When you go into Twin Motion and you go to Import, I can go to direct link and it's going to find a file that has direct link turned on. And I'm going to just raise this here because it's hiding the import. And I'm going to import this object as a direct link. Now, um, it imports the whole scene. So I could change this topography in Rhino if I wanted to. Maybe I want to squish it down. Maybe it's too extreme. So I'm just going to shrink it in one dimension. So you can see here I'm lowering these hills to something much more soft. And just reset my C plane. You don't have to follow this exactly. I'm just showing you that I'm changing this. And I go to Datasmith and hit Synchronize. And when I go to Twin Motion, now my hills are also much smaller. Uh, you can see here that they're no longer super tall. They are registering the same difference that I had before. Now, it doesn't have to be just for one object. I could make a series of objects that I want to design with. Hit Synchronize. And going into Twin Motion, wow, it's it's already there before I can even flip uh, mode. But you can see here it brings them in as separate objects. So you know I could color these. Whoa, Control. 
is to do multiple select, uh, which is fine. I'll go to materials, I'll color these, this color. I'm gonna color this landscape. Oh, it seems to be putting them all in the same layer. Okay, so you may need to separate these out if you wanna treat them uh, uniquely. Uh, but in any case, you can color these as you need be if, if wanted. Um, and so that's what Datasmith does. So Datasmith from Twinmotion Plugins Rhino allows you to do this real-time connection. And this could be handy for you if you're doing some finessing and some detailing. And of course, I can go back to my library and always add on elements if I want to, adding on some Norway spruces. Feels a little Wes Anderson with this color uh, and these trees. Let me just close up my library. And you can start to see what you can make here. Um, so that helps you manage the four different imports. Now, I didn't cover the, the last one, but I'll, I'll show you what happens anyway. So I'm just going to go to File, New Scene. I don't want to save this. I want to go to Import. I want to import a point cloud. Uh, if you have a point cloud, this could be fun. Uh, I'm going to show you a point cloud that I have. Actually, even better. I think I probably saved it. <clears throat> As written in last year's version. I'm just going to convert this file, but just to show you for fun, what does importing a point cloud look like? And while it's loading, uh, oh, it has some missing files here. I'll just go OK. Uh, this is a scan that I took of a house in my family, my Italian side of the family's hometown. And it was a scan of the house that I made, a little apartment house that was our original home in Bovino. And um, I scanned it with an iPad with its LiDAR function. Oh, it has my shadow here. Uh, and yeah, it's pretty amazing at being able to change point sizes. You can ask it to cast or not cast shadows. You can change to square or circle, collision quality high, uh, different pivot modes. I can even do a solid color to make it look like it's clay. Uh, some fascinating stuff here. Again, this is coming right out of Unreal Engine, so and its connection with Quix, Quixel Mega Scans. Uh, so this combo, this ecosystem of technology that I was mentioning, is really hyper beneficial here to do lots of fun stuff. Um, so that was bringing in a point cloud as the last one. So we covered geometry. It doesn't do very much, uh, but you could bring in singular objects from somewhere. Direct Link has that automatic synchronization connection. Landscape allows you to do the sculpting and the painting if you want, but remember, you can't treat it as a direct link, so be mindful. And then Point Cloud does a Point Cloud. So let's see what else we wanted to cover here. How do you get into XR uh, or VR rather in this case? Um, it's pretty easy. I think we covered this on day one. Uh, basically what you would do is go to the eyeball, go to VR uh, or F10. You need to have your headset plugged in and you'll start to see your scene in VR. So that's pretty easy. And the last thing is, how do you record when you're in VR if you want to do VR uh, this way, or if you want to just 
uh, record a video of you flying through your landscape, you could also do that. Um, let's just talk about navigation. Let's go into Twin Motion. I'm just going to make a new scene. No, don't want to save this. Uh, let's let's bring in a landscape. Or terrain rather. I'm gonna get rid of the starting ground. I need that. This one I am gonna sculpt it just to try a couple things. It's a lot bigger and a lot more intense. All right, now we got some topography. Let's do this. Okay, so <clears throat> when moving around, uh, you'll notice that there's a couple of different modes here. There is uh, pre pedestrian mode. If I click on this, I'll notice that I'm in drone mode, which allows me to fly up over my terrain or fly down, very akin to the drone effect. But I can also click on pedestrian mode, which locks me right on the ground. I think there might be some sound coming through. I'm just going to turn that down. It's a bit loud. But I can use my 3D mouse to move around as well. If not, I can use my left key, my right key, my forward key. And you'll notice that I'm just moving around on my topography that I've sculpted. I can also use WASD. For those of you who are gamers, uh, you'll see the keyboard glitching out at the bottom as I'm moving forward and back and forward. <clears throat> Turning your camera, you would need to do by hand. Right mouse button does that, unless you use the 3D mouse. But some pretty easy, pretty easy stuff here. Now, if you wanted to record this, of course, you can use your media and video. You can make videos by stringing together keyframes. If you don't want to do that and you want to record right from your screen, you could um, make this full screen. And this is the uh, tip that our, our friend at IT was able to give us tips and tricks. Oh, it's not in tips and tricks. Where is it? Technical, real-time rendering in XR, screen recording using NVIDIA GeForce. If you guys have NVIDIA GeForce cards or any of the NVIDIA cards, really, um, NVIDIA will treat Twin Motion as a video game which basically means it's tuned to allow you to record. And how to access that recording feature, you can do simply by hitting Alt-Z on your keyboard, 